My name is David Whitworth, and I am married. I have a little baby boy. He is seven months. I don't know if they're in the room. They're not here yet. Are they here? Yeah. They're here. Hi. Kind of here. I see him. Allie, and then that's my wife, Allie, and my son, Duke Wyatt. He's seven months. He's got the Metallica shirt on today. Little rebel. Um, he also turned on the alarm. Y'all heard in Anna's message. So he was playing with peas and hit the alarm. Just making our mark. Um, yeah, so today I just wanted to talk a little bit about my story and the pursuit of excellence and why I'm even talking about it. And I come from a very, like, if you know anything about me, like, I spent a lot of years at the International House of Prayer, and I'm at Bethel now, and it's, like, spontaneous galore. And so why would I be talking about the pursuit of excellence and, like, making things really refined and awesome and how that even works? Um, and so, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about just my background and how I came to be that I even am here. It was never really a dream to be a, like a worship drummer or like a musician in this sense. I never thought it would be, honestly, I never thought it would be this awesome. <laughs> uh, you know, when you're younger, you have dreams of like being a, a rock star or like this famous musician that plays stadiums or something. Um, but it took a completely different turn in my life. And um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, born and raised in Texas, um, a little town called Bastrop. It's like... 20 minutes outside of Austin. I grew up on a goat farm, believe it or not. Caleb, can you help the reverb? Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> and the delay. Uh, hey, dude. Of course, all the audio guys are here. Whoa. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I told I was like, I should have prepared more. Um, so yeah, so grow, I grew up on a goat farm, believe it or not. Um, both of my parents, my mom and dad, were veterinarians. And um, it, was a, it was an awesome childhood because I had tons of animals to play with. Um, a lot of goats. Um, I, I neutered a lot of goats, believe it or not. That's a random fact about me. You probably didn't care to know about it. Um, but yeah, so... Um, grew up on a goat farm. Um, as a, as any drummer, like when you, at least a lot of drummers I met, like when you're a baby, like you just start banging on stuff, like pots and pans, whatever. And my mom was like, okay, quit taking my pots and pans, and just bought me a drum set, and so I could beat on that. And so I started playing when I was like six. I just had a kit set up like in the garage, and I would just in between like feeding goats or whatever. As a little kid, I just go in, <laughs> hit the drums. Um, but when I was about 11 years old, um, I found Hillsong, someone gave me a Hillsong United CD. And so I just, I, had, I mean, you know, this, the disc mans, you, I'm in my 30s, so get the disc mans, you put on the headphones and hit play, hope it didn't skip. Um, but I would play the Hillsong United um, for hours. Like, that was just like, I mean, the early stuff. So it was my, I, fe I started feeling like the presence of God when I was playing drums. And it, um, it became addicting. Like I was like, I fell in love with the presence of God on the drum set, listening to worship music. It's dry, sorry. <laughs> um, so at a at an early age, I just fell in love with this idea that like, wow, I can play drums and feel the presence of God, and this is cool. Like I don't know what that means, but this is awesome. So I would. And it's, you know, like, growing up on the farm, doing all the chores, everything, my parents were so kind, they, like, ended up giving me a nicer drum set, and I started playing in church and getting really involved, and we had a kids' praise team, which was sick. <laughs> <laughs> like, a, it was like drums, flute, and a, a keyboard. <laughs> but we did our best, and, um, and from there, you know, it was like, I remember the day that I got, I think I was 13, or 12 or 13, and um, I, and I got that sweet call to play main service at church, you know, I lost my mind. Uh, I played terrible, you know, sped everything up, but that was the big thing back then, if you could play, you know, big church. Um, so I grew up in the church, playing church music, and I still, like, 
from that eight, that marking moment at 11, like, fell in love with the presence of God on the drum. So I was addicted to it. So I had this thing in my heart. It was just, I don't know what it was. It was just, like, planted there from an early age. Um, so, but when I was 13 years old, these are just kind of giving you a little backdrop to my story. And how, it'll all play into Bethel Music Tours and all the things. But um, when I was 13... Um, my mom passed away. She had a brain aneurysm, and it was very, very, like, shocking out of nowhere. Um, she was, like, the, the classic, like, you know, take the kids to soccer practice, and she did everything. Like, she was just, like, one of those all-American moms, and I remember my, I have an older brother, older sister, and they, um, they were in public school. I was still in, like, this Christian school thing, and they, when this happened, it was, I mean, obviously it's, you know, traumatic, and but I remember, like, immediately, I felt like this thing, the Lord, like, the, the life is but a vapor, like that whole scripture, um, what's it mean? Yeah, James 4, 14, um, but this, there was this, another impression to me that time is precious, we are fragile, life is short, eternity is long, like, and growing up in the Texas, like, culture, like, everything is, like, go to school, get a job, like, nine to five, um, you know, nothing wrong with it, but it was just, like, in this moment, I know that, man, like, life is really fragile, like, my mom, who was a veterinarian, like, had three kids, and the whole, like, living this American dream, whatever that looked like, like, she, it just ended like that, and so, I knew from that moment on, it's like, man, I'm gonna live my life, like, so what the Lord has put in my heart, like, I have to go after it no matter what. Like, no matter the cost, no matter what, life is but a vapor. And, and so from that moment on, this is a very marking moment in my life. And um, I didn't know what it looked like, obviously, but I just knew that, like, it wasn't like, I'm not going to school, like, you know, forget all that. It was more of a just, like, I have to follow the passion in my heart, and I have to follow my dreams. And that was no matter the cost. And so that was... From, I mean, not to get all down and sad, so I just had to put that in the story, but um, later, it's crazy because later on, I, like, we got her journals, like, we were reading through her journals, and she had been praying, her best friend had a lot of her journals, and she had been praying, she would go into my room and pray over my drum set, that, like, my drumming would reach the nations, and I would travel the world, and stuff that I, like, never knew until I was in my 20s, um, she was a praying mom, so... Really grateful for her. And it's ironic that I ended up at the International House of Prayer um, for many years. Um, so anyway, so fast forward, you know, go through high school. Um, still have this burning desire for drumming and worship, and I didn't know how to express it. I'm in Texas, and it's like in close to Austin. There wasn't like a great worship scene, per se, um, whatever that looked like. And But I was just, I was serving where I was in that church, and being faithful, but I still had this thing of, like, there has to be something more, like, and a lot of our friend groups were, it was, like, just kind of mediocre Christianity, and, like, go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, and you play worship music, but the rest of the time, you know, it's just whatever, not really loving God that much, um, but, yeah, so I, I'm getting to the, so after, I'm getting there, <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time on this part. Um, so yeah, so fast forward through high school, I'm two years into college, and I'm just, at this point, I'm like, you know, God, I'm just going to do this on my own, because I don't know how to, like, I don't even know what it is that I want to do, but it has to be bigger, it has, what is it? I was just so frustrated through all high school and college, like, with this thing, and, um, two years into college, I'm doing, like, music production at this college in San Antonio, and one of my buddies, he said, hey, do you want to come to a One Thing conference in Kansas City? It's like this worship conference. Um, and I was like, yeah, like, who's playing? Like, is it Chris Tomlin or, like, Passion? Like, what big names are there? So that was big in the worship music. Um, but, and he was like, no, they won't be there. And I was like, all right, so. <laughs> but I thought, you know, I, I needed something to break in my life. I needed a breakthrough. And so I said, yeah, I'll go. So... We went to Kansas City, and as we're going there, you know, I'm like reading about I or like about this conference, and I don't understand it because I'm like, why would there be, you know, 24/7 worship and prayers? Like this is crazy. Um, but we go to this conference, 
And I'm, I put my fleece out before the Lord. I said, God, like, I need breakthrough. I need answers. Like, why did you put me here on this earth? Like, why, why do I have this burning desire in my heart for worship and for um, to play drums and to, like, do all these things? Why, and I can't do them. Why? 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 <laughs> you know, like, and um, I, I put it before the Lord. And I said, I know you're faithful to answer. I think you're faithful to answer. And so I'm asking you, will you show me? Um, and so, yeah, I put out my fleece. I also tried fasting for the first time. You know, one thing is a four-day conference. And so I was like, I'll fast for these four days. I need answers. You'll show up. So my fasting was no food, just chocolate milk. That was like, <laughs> I carried it. I mean, <laughs> it was kind of fasting. He knew my heart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I drank a ton of chocolate milk. It was probably the worst, like four days straight of chocolate milk. Um, but so I went with like my friend, his name is Robert, and like six other people from our church back home. And a lot of them were they weren't they were there for the conference, you know, they were excited, worship woohoo. I was there like I had to have answers. Like there was there was there was nothing else for me. Like I had to figure out what this was in my heart, and I had to figure out why he put that there. So four days into this thing, it's the last day, eleven forty-five. They go till midnight the last night. It's eleven forty-five. I'm there like, dear God, I have fifteen minutes. Like show yourself. <laughs> My, fleet, my thing was, if you don't answer me in these four days, which is a terrible thing to do, you know. But I was young. I was just like, I, I know you're faithful. Answer me. Like, what is this? Um, and this band, Merchant Band, was playing. It's uh, Tim Reimer and Marcus Meyer. Great songwriter guys. They were playing a delirious song. And the, the youth group guys that I were with, they had all went home. Like, everyone like everyone in our group had left. And I was like, no, I'm staying till midnight. Like, I'm just going to do it. Um, so I'm just there worshiping, and all of a sudden, it hit me like a flood. Like, I, I get chills thinking about it, but it was, I've never had an encounter like this in my life. Just this, and this is the only one. It was layers deep, hit me like a flood. Like, I felt the Father's love for the first time. I felt him, like, he was with me the whole way through my mom's passing, and why he put those dreams and desires in my heart. So you have this, like, this is probably like a 10-second encounter. At the same time, these four screens pop up. And he's showing me exactly where to go in the next season of my life. And, um, and it was like there was this sweeping shot of a sea of people. And I was on the drum set. And there was like another shot of me in this, on this table with these cool looking kids like reading the word. Like there was, it was layers deep of like it's okay to be passionate about me. It's okay to be passionate about worship music. I put these dreams and desires in your heart. And here's the next steps to take. And so, and it was in Kansas City, here at the International House of Prayer, and I was like, I had no idea what it meant. Um, it was crazy, like, these, try to imagine this, like, I would see the words, like, I love you, but it was ten, every word I had, like, ten meanings. Love had ten, like, it was, like, layers, every word had, like, different meanings. It was crazy. <laughs> I don't know how to play, it was wild. Um, but I, I was marked from that day forward. It's like, I know what I'm supposed to do, I know, I know where I'm supposed to be. So... I, uh, like, two months later, I quit school and quit my job and the church back home and said, I'm moving to Kansas City. And they were like, you're crazy. I was like, I'm just doing it. So I went, and I'm trying to make, not make this too long. Um, so I go to Kansas City, and, you know, I apply for their, I think I was there for their worship school, and um, they had, like, a music school, and I was, I was there for maybe six days, and I was like, you know, doing the process, and I said, hey, I'm here to like play drums, be a part of your worship school, and they're like, oh, no, you can't play drums for the first year, and I was like, what? I was like, no, no, no. I was like, I just had like this encounter, like, no, I'm supposed to be here. Like, what are you talking about? I was like, I heard from God, so. Uh, she's like, no, you have to like, you have to be here for a year, do an internship, and then you can audition to be on one of the teams. Um, so I was like, okay, great. You know, so I would so every day for a year I would sit in a prayer room 
and watch these worship teams lead, and I had to deal with so much stuff in my heart, like identity as a drummer, like, is this, who, is this like my identity? Like, what? Like, why do I feel all these weird things? Like, I felt like, oh, I'm better than that guy, or like, I should be up there. I could do that hair. Like, they're terrible. You know, all these things, like, you know, all the things we have. Um, but he slowly broke down these walls in my heart of, like, my identity being a drummer and, like, these pride issues and, like, all these things, like, that I kind of conjured up myself. And it's kind of weird. Picture it like he put a dream in my heart and then I surrounded it with my own stuff and it felt, like, a little bit, like, cor- corroded and, like, weird so he had to break all that and it just made it pure again and um so it took about a, like a year of detoxing and then like from that moment I remember um so a year passed and I was finally in a really good spot in my heart and um yeah I remember going to the auditions and it's like Misty Edwards and Justin Rizzo and all these big time I have worship leaders and I was like sweating I was like oh my gosh but I auditioned next day I got a call to join a worship team, and I joined, and then like two months later, I got asked by a merchant band, who I had this encounter with at one thing, to do, to travel the world. So, like to do all these crazy things. So, imagine the things that I saw in this vision, I was actually living them out. Like, so I went and for the next like two years, I was reliving that encounter that I had. So I went with merchant band, and we traveled to Asia, and Mexico, and all these places. And, but it was, it was crazy because it was, nothing, there was no pride, there was no like, you know, playing in front of thousands, it was this place of like, he's worthy, this is the greatest thing ever to happen to me, I'm so happy. So, it was, he, he fulfilled the dreams that I had, like, within like a, a, a year period, that, but he's like, dream bigger, so, <laughs> but it was, it was a wild season, so, so after that, I joined Corey's team, probably like a year into IHOP. Corey Asbury and Caleb Culver. Um, Woo! Yeah, we, we, um, oh man, we had a lot of history at the International House of Prayer. Um, yeah, they, but my time at IHOP, it taught me so much. Like, I wouldn't be able to do, probably none of us be able to do what we do today without that season we had at IHOP. And we had to learn how to The awakening happened, like Anna was talking about this morning, and we had to learn how to play while people were getting healed, and to play while people were getting prayed for, and one guy got out of a wheelchair, like, what do you play while a guy's getting out of a wheelchair? (laughs) (laughs) So I prophesied, I'm like, what? What am I? So there was a a big learning curve throughout the whole awakening. We learned how to do corporate, we learned how to do, you know, times of just waiting. Um, there was a patience that we had to learn. And all this plays into um, like the, the pursuit of excellence because the, the season that I spent there, it taught me that patience. And that's one of the main key things that you have to have um, when pursuing this thing called excellence. Um, you know, when you're making your set list and you're getting your things dialed, if you don't have the know-how or the patience to say, hey, like, he's doing something different, like, if you don't have the, the patience to, like, go that way that he's going, then, like, you can kind of just bulldoze and just do the same thing over and over again, and it gets a little watered down and mundane and funky, McDunky. Um, okay, so, so excellence, let's talk about it. Um, excellence is essentially bringing your collective, wait, sorry. Wrong notes. Oh yeah. Awakening, talked about that. The reason I left IHOP, this funny, Caleb and Corey, they all because they left. They all moved to Colorado and I was there to fend for myself. <laughs> so I I ended up um, meeting Jeremy Riddle along the way and he invited me out to Bethel. Um, he said, hey, would you want to come and be a part of our worship community and be head of the drummers and, you know, just kind of be a part of what we're doing? And this is really before Bethel Music even took off. It was 2013, so. Oh, and I had just started dating Allie, so it was a lot happening. Um, but yeah, I said, okay, let's do it. You know, it was like one of those deals. I didn't have a big encounter to say, hey, let's go. It just felt, I felt peace and excitement on something. And so 
I felt his pleasure being like, I trust you to make this next move, so I did it. And I also asked Allie to marry me and to move to California, so she was like, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so we went, and it was quite the journey there. Um, okay, so, the pursuit of excellence. And why do we worship? Because he is worthy, and what is our response? It's excellence and surrender. Um, Eugene Patterson says, Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend, the pre and attend to the presence of God. I love this quote because it paints the picture that as we take our eyes off ourselves and focus them on God, our worship becomes a powerful strategy, a force for good, changing the environment around us. Um, these are just a few points on worship and why I feel like it requires excellence. Um, excellence, it might look a little different than what we think like. It's not perfection. Um, it's bringing your best every day. Um, so here's a few points. Um, Romans 12.1 exhorts us, Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. As Christians, we are to lead lives of worship, eager to always be head of the worshiping crowd. Don't make worship about your worthiness or about what is wrong with you, but instead focus on what is right with Him. It's easy to approach the throne in worship when we are focusing on the character of God. He is good, He is kind, He is worthy of all of our praise. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in splendor of His holiness. Um, so I'm just throwing out some stuff for you guys. Um, in, in writing songs, like there's, there's such a temptation to write songs about our feelings, our seasons, and the ups and downs of life. And there is a place for these songs, yet I know, um, what I know is that songs that speak to God's unchanging nature, His holiness and the glory to His name, are songs that seem to shift the atmosphere and cause our hearts to focus on who He is, despite our circumstances, and once again allow us to take the focus off ourselves and onto Jesus. Worship is about Him and only Him. Um, I have this, so, I, have, I don't know why, I mean it's, I think I've, you know, I'm just a country kid from Texas, and I just said yes, and he, I said yes, and I went through some doors, and I found myself in the craziest places. Um, I was, we did this worship event um, a few months ago in December with Jeremy Riddle and Stephanie Gretzinger and Amanda Cook, and we're playing, and it's in Orlando, and Benny Hinn shows up, like, just in the back room. And I'm like, you know, what? <laughs> <laughs> but it was really cool because Benny now is, he's, he's such a father, um, he was so kind and he just like came over to us. He, was, he actually said, I don't, it's like, I don't love your music, but he's like, he's like, don't change what you're doing. Um, and he just talked, he talked about this. He talked about writing songs from the scripture. He said, stop writing from your diaries and write from the scripture. He's like, these are the songs that are, will shift generations. Um, he also talked about not losing the trust of God. This really marked me because he t said, don't lose his trust. Don't lose his trust. He said, I almost lost his trust. And up in ministry and money and all these things. He's like, don't lose his trust. So those are two big things that took away from it. Um, but yeah, on the idea of just writing songs from the scripture and about just these high praise songs, I'm a big champion of that because I love it. I mean, there's there's place for all the journal songs and the processy songs for sure. Bethel does a lot of them. Um, but yeah, worship is about him and only him. Um, so I'll talk a little bit also about how worship is led, not only from a platform, but in the congregation as well. This is another thing on the excellence side that I'll get into in just a minute, um, is lighting. Like, you wouldn't think about it, but I don't know why like, I've been placed. I, I have this every detail. I'll talk about, I'll talk about the Bethel Music Tours and um, how everything is so intentional and how lighting actually plays a massive role, not only on the stage, but in the... Um, in the audience, like, being able to see one another worship and lift their hands, like, we have, 
And, you know, Jen Johnson always encourages us to sit on the front row and, like, worship with everything you have because you're actually leading the people behind you. And so, and it, there's this chain reaction where you're giving permission for the people behind you to, oh, I can lift my hands too. Like, okay, oh, I can dance, I can spin. Like, and if you can't see one another doing that, then it's like, you're just kind of like there in your own bubble. So, anyways, okay, so, about worship is led. The psalmist in Psalm 42.4 says, I was always at the head of the worshiping crowd right out in front, leading them all, eager to arrive and worship, shouting, praising, singing, and thanksgiving. So what does it mean to be out front of the worshiping crowd? I believe that worship cannot and must not just be led from the platform, platform, but must be an environment we cultivate. A culture that we encourage from the, fur- the furthest seat in our sanctuaries to the worship leader at the front of the crowd. So not only on the stage, but in your seat, like I was saying. Does that make sense? Like, it's very important, I think, even as um, we're leading our worship teams to really encourage, like, people that aren't playing, like, hey, you're leading even though you're not on stage. Like, be in there in the front row and, like, just go for it. Act crazy. Um, how much time do I have? I might have to skip some goodies. How much time do I have? 12, 15. Okay, we're good. Um... So, like I said, we're still on these points about just kind of overall worship and why it's requiring our response. Um, so, worship changes the atmosphere of your life. We know this. We're worshipers. Have you ever walked into a service where there is praise and worship that you can just sense the presence of God? Mm-hmm. There's something tangible in the atmosphere of a room where people are worshiping in song. In the same way that worship can do that in a room, it can do it in your life as well. Mm-hmm. Worship is a unifier. Worship unifies and brings blessings. It's a stake in the ground, an unfutable truth, and a testimony to the glory of God. Worship breaks down walls of divide that have seemed impossible. You can see age-old denominational denominational divides that have been set aside for the sake of a worship song. I truly believe that God uses worship and worship leaders and teams to go to many places where perhaps pastors and preachers may not ever be able to go or be invited to. Our churches must be environments of worship, but most importantly, let us never forget who it is we worship. We worship a risen and reigning king, a powerful God, and a personal savior. He is worthy of all of our praises, all of our adoration, and all of our worship. So just kind of putting that out there to kind of set the tone of why the heck our response should be excellence in this. I mean, duh. You know what I mean? Like, why? Why? I, there, I get in this 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 battle sometimes with worship leaders about like, you know, I don't want to make a set list. I just want to like, let's just see where the Holy Spirit leads us. And I'm like, that sounds lazy to me because yes, let's see where the Holy Spirit leads us. But our default should be excellence. Like, if we don't like, if we don't have a set list, if we don't have a roadmap, then if the Holy Spirit doesn't show up how we thought he would, then you're just kind of stuck there <laughs> noodling on your heart. So, the, that's something that I preach to our guys um, about just being prepared, being prepared to the utmost. Um, so, my job titles, I wear a few different hats in Redding, California for Bethel Church. I'm over our Friday night worship teams. Um, I am a drum section leader. And I am our live events director for Bethel Music Tours. And so I, it's something that I'm really trying to preach. Like, our default should be excellence. Our default should. We shouldn't come to soundcheck and learn our parts. We shouldn't come to, or like, show up and make a set list, you know, like, being unprepared. Our default should be excellence. We should put everything that we have, so much preparation, on the forefront. And if he does something else, great. We have to have that know-how and we have to put our sails up. Yeah, okay, let's, let's deviate. Let's leave it all. But it's not wasted worship. We have to know that. Like everything that we put into this, like I'm, I, I make so many tracks. I'm, I do so much in Ableton and step prep. And then we get to the set and we don't do any of it. And I had to come to the realization. I couldn't be mad, but I had to come to the realization that this isn't wasted worship. Like just because we didn't use this song or do whatever. It's not wasted. Um, I remember Cass Langton, she's from Hillsong. She's a creative director of everything, of worship. Um, but she was talking about how, you know, they have insane songwriters there, and 
everyone's pumping out these crazy songs, and you know, how do you, how do you choose songs for an album? And they, they, she just went on this whole tangent about it's not wasted worship just because your song doesn't get put on an album or whatever. It's like, it's not unseen, you know? And I think it's important to remember that when we're prepping and we're creating, like, even knowing that even if it doesn't, your song doesn't get used or, you know, the set list changes, it's not wasted worship. The preparation is not wasted worship. Um, okay, so... Excellence starts with the expectation we set for ourselves, but a culture of excellence in a team can only be created by the expectation of our leadership. So, as a leader, I'm creating that expectation for our team. Hey guys, let's be excellent. Let's, I'm always encouraging. Um, I've had to learn how to not be harsh, like with people, you know, if you know something they don't know, like learning language to be like, hey, you know, I hit them with the compliment sandwich. You know, like, <laughs> you are so good at this. Here's a, like, a little pain point. Maybe, like, you know, practice your parts at home. But I know you're going to crush it. Like, you know, so, the old compliment sandwich. Um, yeah, so, um, you encouraged to practice, practice, practice. Um, being prepared. Um, your best is going to be progressive. Remember, excellence is bringing your best today. So, Every day we want to keep growing our craft, we want to keep growing um, our ideas and not get stuck on what, what worked last season, you know, so it's always, it's very important to uh, keep progressing. Um, our excellence today is different than our excellence yesterday. Um, we might skip some of these. Yeah, excellence looks like personal practice, getting better at your craft. If you feel as though you're good enough, please recheck your approach. Um, <laughs> say it again, yeah, I will. If you feel as though you're good enough, please recheck your approach. Um, excellence takes hard work and means we are continually getting better. Um, be aware of where you want to be and set realistic goals for yourself. Like I said, don't be content with staying where you are. God wants our best, and the bottom line is our best will continually be changing um, with more time, work, and experience. Approach what you always do with fresh eyes. If we want our church to be a place of innovation and an initiative, we can't do this by staying the same. Like I was saying, in a new season, we need to look at what we're doing with fresh eyes. Different seasons call for new strategies, um, New sounds, ideas, techniques, all the things. Um, so yeah, so for, I'll just speak a little bit about, we just did this tour called the Victory Tour for Bethel Music, and I just recently got this job of, it's kind of a new thing, like, you know, live, director of live events. I was like, what the heck does that even mean? Like, you, so they're like, you know, like set list, like the whole thing, like for a, a worship night for Bethel Tour. Um, Previous years, so I've been traveling with Bell's Music for almost five and a half years or so. Um, and our tours back when were very, like, they were awesome in their presence field, but there's still so many, like, loose ends. And, you know, like, we would, the lights wouldn't be working, or, like, you know, the kick drum mic is unplugged. You know, all these little things, and there was no one really running point on it. We just, like, we just wanted to worship, which is, I love that heart. You know, like I said, like, my whole background is just, like, Let's go for it. Like, I was in spontaneous world forever. Um, but taking over this role, I wanted to make everything so intentional. Like, there was no wasted moment in the night. So the moment it's, it's we open doors at 6 p.m. and it ends at 10 p.m. Like, there's nothing wasted in those four hours. So we have an, we had an opener. Her name's Tasha Cox Leonard. She's wow. insane. Yes. Um, so, and we had like pre-roll, so it was everything from, okay, let's make the pre-roll music awesome, let's make the screens have important information we need to say, like, and I also wanted to make the pre-roll music, like, the the actual, the songs and the pre-roll music actually work into her set. So, whether that was knowing what key she was going in, having the last song, and pre-roll music goes, so there's all these little things that I was, I thought, man, if I'm bringing my best, my, what I, what can I do to make this my best, so... That's one of the little things. Um, also, for spontaneous stuff, for an, our own set, like, I wanted to make a set list where we get 
we wanted an awesome, I wanted an awesome opener. It's like, let's just make this the best. It's victory tour. Let's make it awesome, victorious, huge opener. So we made it, and it was great. And then um, I just thought, we also need, like, we can't forget our DNA. Like, we want to go after healing. We want to go after um, spontaneous moments. We want to leave space where we can actually, like, have moments where we can just breathe. And so I actually built that into the set list. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think, um, don't, I don't think we need to overthink it, you know? I don't think we need to overthink set lists. Like, we're, we're worshiping a living and breathing God, and our set list can be that way, and we can make them and be confident and move forward. I deal with a lot of worship leaders that just don't want to make set lists, and it bothers me sometimes. Some people, you know, the Holy Spirit can tell you on Tuesday what we're doing on Sunday. Um, but, yeah, so I think it was really, it was important for me to um, put in this time. So we, we have like, the healing times are, we put in, we have a song called, um, or the Hells have a song called You Came, and we did it on tour. Um, and at the end of it, we like, okay, let's float on some music and let's go after healing. So any of the worship leaders, if you have a word of knowledge or you have, you're feeling something, just, just go after it. And that is built into the set list, but what happens every night is completely different, you know? And it goes, sometimes it goes, 15 minutes, sometimes it goes 30 minutes. Um, and if that's the case, we'll cut a song and we just, it's on the fly. So um, I, there's still room in, in, this, in the spirit of excellence. There's always room for deviation. There's always room for change. And like I said, it's a, a living and breathing, always moving kind of idea. Um, and it's for set list. Um, any questions? I want to open this up for questions. Sorry, I'm just rambling. If not, I'll keep talking. Um, but I wanted to open it up just for if you guys have any questions or anything, or if this is not making sense, or you're like, dude, I don't agree at all. <laughs> but excellence, and uh, it's something that I really, really preach. Like for our drummers, um, we have nine guys that are on our team, and my thing is like, hey, like your base level is to know these songs inside and out. Like you shouldn't have to like figure out a part when you come to church, like, if you're not putting in the work beforehand, like, then, you know, go to another church, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the base level, and that's the, the, as a leader, that's the standard I'm setting, and it's not in a harsh way, it's just, hey, like, think about, if you don't have to think about the parts, and you actually can play with freedom, mm -hmm. like, there's something that unlocks in the prophetic realm, there's something that'll unlock you when you're playing, the confidence that you have going into a set, there's so many times that I deal with musicians that are not confident if we don't have a set list. They, they get so timid and scared, even in the prophetic moments. But if you have a game plan, they're prepared, they're rehearsed, and then we deviate from the set list, there's like this confidence, like, I did the best that I could do. Like, they just have this, they can stand up straighter, they can have this confidence, yeah, I can play this, like, in a spontaneous moment. There's more confidence when, in musicians when you come prepared. Um, it's very important. Um, yeah, any questions? No questions? That was. Yeah, I have a Yeah. Hi, it's Ms. Williams from Life Church in Westboro, New York. Awesome. <laughs> so, I'm kind of new to all this. Maybe I've been playing for about a year base. And uh, but I have a lot of hard time with the clicker trying to hear. Trying to hear the clicker. The, the clicker, yeah. And I like that then, one. And the worship leader speaks in your ear. Sure. And you're listening to all these other sounds. And I really want to just worship when I'm playing. Yeah. So uh, if you could kind of guide me in maybe the um, order of events I should focus on to get where I want to be in the worshiping and playing at the same time. Totally. Thank you. Uh, great question. Um, the clicker, I like the, <laughs> like the remote or the no. So I I used to hate I used to hate a metronome. Like I was like anti metronome. How can the spirit move if you have a metronome? Um, but the more I, the more I just practice, start practice with, practicing with it at home, and the more I did, the less and less I could hear it. And then from there, it's I don't hear the click anymore. 
But if you do hear a click, you're off the click. Right. But <laughs> uh, I, think I think it's important to, to practice more at home with the metronome, and it'll you'll become more used to it. And um, yeah, I mean that's honestly the best thing you can do. And I think work working on your in your mix to where it feels awesome and. Um, like I mix mine like kind of like a live CD type feel. I, that comes with time, but there is there is a spot <laughs> where you can worship and you can enjoy His presence and His goodness with a metronome. <laughs> it just takes a little bit of time and practice with it at home, and so you're not just like stressed out during your church services with it. But yeah, the, yeah. I play an instrument, actually I play two instruments that are on the backbeat of uh, the clicker. So the bass player is doing one thing, I'm doing the opposite. So just to try and um, try and stay with that, is uh, what do you recommend for that? Or? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Are you asking? What are you asking? <laughs> well, just to keep, just to hear the clicker. I, I've never really heard the term clicker. I always thought it was just metronome. That's really yeah, clicker clicker's a new term. I, li I like it though. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought the drummer was supposed to be the beat, but sometimes in the bands that I play, uh, I, my instrument is an acoustic, so I am actually the drummer. By, by, by my chop, you know, mandolin chops, I don't know if you know what mandolin chops are. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm keeping the beat. But uh, just how to do that, how to work with others in that, how to. I'm still learning, so. Yeah, totally. Totally. I think when you're playing with a metronome, it takes a lot of practice because sometimes the, um, the acoustic can be right on the click, the drummer's dragging, the singers are singing way ahead of the beat, you know? And so I think it's. My default is I'm on the click, but I'm not like. Like, Carrie Job is a good example of this. She sings so far behind the click, it's like, where are we? Um, but I think it's important for encouraging your drummer to stay pretty locked in on the metronome and then kind of follow the drummer. You know, if he's dragging a little bit, if he's speeding up a little bit, kind of stay with him, and I think you'll err on the side of it being better than worse. Like, if you're perfectly on the click and he's not, then... I think just err with him a little bit, and if he's struggle struggle bussing, then that's like an outside combo. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you had a question. I'll get to you. Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on a, on a practical level, um, a lot of us are using Ableton Live, right? Mm -hmm. You talked about creating that space in your song. Yeah. Take like Raise a Hallelujah, for instance. Mm -hmm. There's like the eight minute recording of it. Yeah. The song kind of wraps itself up with the verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, about four and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. Even, for instance, like last night specifically, you're at the drum set. We kind of do the arrangement of the song. Then there's that space. Like, what are you seeing on your Ableton live screen? Is there a click track that's going and you're waiting to initiate the next, you know, spontaneous moment? Can you talk about that transition sure. for you as a drummer? Yeah, sure. Um, well, Caleb was running all the track goodies last night. Um, but I, for our tours, I run it. And we do raise a hallelujah. Um, and we do it with spontaneous. But... Um, so essentially we do that four and a half minute arrangement just straight through and then the tracks will fade out and so but everything has markers like the chorus the verse whatever has markers so if we go back we, we do spontaneous sometimes we don't go back into it um, sometimes we just do a whatever chorus but if we do go back into it we have the option to just fire like a last chorus or last verse so we do the we have it set up where we just do that four minutes. We don't stick to the eight minute arrangement. So at the spontaneous part, like it does in the album, that's where we're like fade out the track. So this back half is, because that was specific to that one recording day, you know, and it's not really part of the song. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I also use a, um, a Boss DB90, like spontaneous click. So if I don't want to have to mess with tracks world, I have another metronome that I can just tap in and do it just for spontaneous stuff. Like a follow-up to that, like yep. this morning there's um, Here is in Heaven, mm -hmm. is that large instrumental. Yep. It felt a little forced. You sure. know, we've done that before too, and that like elevation feels, it's like 16 bar yeah. phrase, it just feels like nothing's happening. Right. During the second or third service. 
What do you feel that tension? And as a band, like after you've done a set and you've got a 32 bar interlude and it kind of feels like man, nothing was happening, mm -hmm. do you talk and then mm -hmm. make adjustments to your Ableton tracks and stuff like that? Absolutely. Um, for Bethel services, we we have a, an 8 a.m. We have the luxury of like where everything is streamed and recorded. But usually, if you're feeling that and you can see in the kind of, you're right. You know what I mean? Like, if the collective group is like, man, this 32 bar guitar solo was a little rough, like, <laughs> let's, let's take it back. But um, at Bethel, we, we have an 8, 8 a.m. service and then a 10 30. So after our 8 a.m. service, we go back and we listen and we make adjustments and we'll make adjustments to the tracks. And so, yeah. But usually, like, that instinct that you're feeling, like, it's usually, I wouldn't ignore it, that's for sure. <laughs> We're kind of, it's like making his way back up. <laughs> yeah, uh, just super quick, could you speak to the, or how do you handle the tension being a worshiper and a planner? So, like, uh, I got to be, I got to play bass for a little while for my church, but now I get to lead our production team. So I kind of have both, but my team is a bunch of planners. I don't want things exactly how it's supposed to be, like a planning center or whatever. Um, so how would you manage that tension? And then maybe some... Um, some tips that as the leader I can hang down my team. Well, grace to you. <laughs> um, and yeah, so planning center, one, I don't want to knock planning center, but I miss the old days when like you're in a group text with the worship leader. <laughs> I really do. There's something about that, you know. I mean it's obviously not practical for everyone, but I miss those days. Um, yeah, I think I think we just, we, man, this whole idea of like we have a, you know, our church, we only can have 25 minutes of worship. How do you do spontaneous in 25 minutes of worship? How do you, like our, our thing is very cut and dry. This is a, it's a big, big topic, but I mean, I think if you honor your pastor and you, you know, that's where you want to start with. You want to honor your pastor and you don't want to like fight him and be like, no, we're doing spontaneous for 15, good luck. Right? <laughs> like, if he's not okay with that, then you're dishonoring and I think we're going to get on. Them. So, I think you want to start there, and it's, it could be a conversation you have with your pastor. Say, hey, like after the third song, it would be cool for us to just like just have a breath and just wait, and just kind of just maybe have like two or three minutes of just waiting. And it could be cool there or not, but I think just having those conversations outside of the worship that, and it's so important to talk about these things because you you build up so many like <laughs> preconceived ideas when you don't. Like, even though you're on playing center and you have, like, five songs, you're automatically thinking, oh, we can't do spontaneous, you know? And I think it's important for you to talk about that with your leaders. And um, like I said, it's, I'm, a fa I'm still a fan of the 25-minute sets. Like, you, by, by saying he can't move in a 25-minute set, it's kind of putting him, God, in a box, essentially. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think you, you, you pray for breakthrough and you really contend and you go as hard as you can go in those 25 minutes. And, there's, like... Yeah, I think go from there. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but I mean, I'm a fan. I'm, like I said, I'm a fan of songs and set lists because God can move, and how great is our God? Yeah. He can do it. So, how do you guys inspire excellence with volunteers who, you know, they have a full time job, they're busy, and, you know, you're throwing five songs a week at them? What is it that's pursuing them to not just, you know, take a listen and do it, show up at rehearsal? And, Playing their favorite Eddie Van Halen lick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it it it's really championing that person, like knowing their gift, championing it, and saying, "Hey, like, calling out what you see in them." Like, I, I totally get it, and you know, you deal with the the guys who've playing electric for twenty five years, and they can shred like crazy. But I think it's a it's a real connection with you have to be very intentional with these players and people. I've had to be very intentional. We've had drummers that can shred. I'm talking like crazy to drummers, but it wasn't translating to what we're doing in church, and so it was, it was really like, hey, like, I see your gift, and I know how insanely talented you are. During this set, is it possible <laughs> that, you know, we play these parts, and let's just go from there, you know, and I think really calling out that person and letting, letting them know that you see them and that they're seen it will go a really long way in them actually start coming prepared and serving the song and serving the set. So I would encourage you to do that with the with the shredders. <laughs> that makes sense. So 
how do you continue to foster the on-ramps for the new musicians? Because I like how you made the point that your best continues to get better. So as your team, as, as your mature players on your team continue to mature, continue to get better, you still want to continue to foster the newer and the younger generation. So where do you make that space? Because it was easier for them to have an on-ramp two years ago where you guys were at two years ago. That's a good question. I hope I understood it. Um, so we, and, and just talk to me, I'm not answering. Um, we, we have section leaders, and so part of our job essentially is to raise up musicians to take our jobs. So it's kind of funny. But it's, I always felt like if the, I'm giving, I give away all my secrets and all the things, and I know the Lord is giving me more. So when we on-ramp these new guys, we have, um, usually they are, have gone through our Bible school or whatever, and we go in and we, I usually watch, like for the drummers, I'll go in and watch them in a set and like really encourage them even before they're on our team. And, but once they get onto our team, it's an ongoing process of working with them during sound checks, um, meeting with them for coffee, making sure their hearts are good and they're not mad and bitter. Um, it is an ongoing process of training and raising up new musicians. It's not just the people on the team getting better and better and better. We're actually pouring into our younger guys so we have a lot of musicians that just come through and they're just serving and it's not their full time job. They just they're hungry, you know, and they wanna they wanna get better and they wanna learn. So there's a few um yeah, I mean we have a very strong onboarding process in that in that sense. We we're always training and raising up new and, people. And practically speaking, when and where is that happening? That's not happening for Sunday set, that's happening in some other activities that you're gotcha. doing in the church. So where are you sure. creating those activities? Also? Yeah, so uh, like I said, they usually come from our Bible school. So they've been prepping and playing in worship sets. Um, and then when they come on, they're usually in our smaller campus. We have, it's called Twin View Campus. And they'll, the drummer, uh, I'll, for all the musicians, they'll start in Twin View and then they usually spend about six months or a year. And then the growth process, if, depending on if they're growing really fast or not growing as well, um, then they'll move up to our Friday night service and then to Sundays. And then if you're on Sundays, then you have the ability to tour. Um, does that kind of make sense? Like, yeah, so, so you, you've strategically mm -hmm. created all of those places. Yep, and we also have a thing called worship rooms, which is like a prayer room type thing. And it's a very, we put a lot of our musicians in there too to kind of learn spontaneous and really foster that um, prophetic spirit on your instrument. So. So for a smaller church, then that becomes the challenge of creating a couple different venues where you can su supervise and cultivate that craft. Yeah, I think for, like, I don't know how practical this is, but I always thought for a smaller church, if you, don't, if you have one campus and you have, like, 50 members, but you have new musicians, like, have them come to rehearsal and have them sit in on the song. You know, have them, like, really incorporate them without necessarily being on the Sunday morning service. I think that would help. It's a great idea. Awesome. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> so I've got a couple new drummers on my team, worship leader. And uh, so when we go in a spontaneous direction, I want to be just as excellent as we are when we're doing a song that's on the set list. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a great job of studying those songs and doing those really well. But like when we launch into a spontaneous direction, sometimes they're like shoving up the dynamic way too high or way too fast. Sure. That kind of thing. How do I encourage them to practice? Like a spontaneous practice, practice. patience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, for a drummer, I deal with a lot of eager drummers as well. You know, they want to like, build it and go. I think that's one thing that I've learned in the prayer room. Is it does come with a little bit of time, but you can preach this and say, hey, look, like, let's be patient. Let's wait. Let's wait for there to be a melody or a chorus. Like, let's not just build over a pad. You know, like let's wait for the music to evolve. And um, I think that's something that I learned in IHOP days was waiting for Caleb or a Cassie to throw out a melody and kind of play off that. And you can create, as a drummer, you can, there's a lot of different timbres on like the tom, how it translates, and the snare, how it translates. So you can add tons of energy without building, per se, and, you know, like just going crazy all at once. So I think adding dynamics is obviously a, a big thing, but I'm just adding layer by layer and listening to the other musicians is something that you can really preach and just say, hey, let's just... Maybe be patient and maybe wait for, um, for a little while. You can tell, hey, maybe wait for a signal from the worship leader to build it. And then kind of start from there. And then, you know, it's a big trust deal, you know. Like, so I think 
you can preach that to them and say, hey, let's start from there. Maybe wait for my foot to start tapping. Then you can kind of build, you know, or that be the starting point and then go from there. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, just to add to what you said, uh, Jake, who played this morning, I don't know if he's in the room, uh, he came to our campus a while ago uh, and loved what he said. It's practicing the prophetic with your instrument. Uh, so just to add what you said, not my question, but. Oh, yeah. Um, so you mentioned building Ableton tracks and uh, kind of making space for that and breathing room. Uh, so, first part of the question is who MDs for you guys? Is it you or is it the leader? So, for Bethel Music? Yeah. Tours. So I have a talk back. Um, I'm kind of anti drummer doing MD because of the cymbal bleed. Right. So if you're playing, you're like, go to the fives. Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, but sure. so we have a, a bass player. Is it a panic button? Is it a panic button that you're hitting? To yeah. Turn it on? Mm-hmm. I have a switch. Our our bass player will have a panic button. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So I've I've been working with our MDs very very intentionally because there's a fine line. This is where we got into the most trouble in Bethel Music Tours, was moving on too fast. Like, we would finish a song, even a moment, and, and the bass player, or it wasn't really the bass, it was whoever, they weren't looking up, and the worship leader was like, you know, keep going, and they'd be like, okay, let's go to, you know, King of My Heart, and then fire the truck, and it's like, they. so we always ran into this thing, and so it's very important for our, and I've been working with the MDs, hey, like, any, you know, transition or turning point in the song, or after set, keep your head up. You know, watch the worship leader. Let's make sure that we're we're ready to move on. Um, but yeah. So what what does their role look like? Uh, I guess what expectations outside of like, hey, here's what you do in a service. Like like you're saying, you need to look up. But I, I guess what's the preparation beforehand for MD? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked. I'll say this real quick because I have MD notes. Um, we have our MDs. This is something that we do at Bethel. Like we have them run our sound checks. So. What we do, um, how we run our sound checks. Drummer will start playing, and the MD will the drummer will plays, and he stays playing basically through the whole sound check. So, and we add one instrument by instrument. So, drum start playing a groove, usually a simple groove. Add toms, a crash every now and then. And the bass player, okay, here comes the bass, and then adds in bass on top of the drums. So we're adding layers by layers. So we have our MD run the sound checks. Um, we have them know the set list, run through the set list, make sure all the keys are right. Um, and we have them confirm set list with worship leaders. Um, they print out the set list. They, um, the, big, the big ones though are, those are little practicals, the big ones are being sensitive, being super sensitive. Um, and the less talking is better. So the less times you have to hear them talk, everyone's at ease. Um, but I think, yeah, less is more. Um, in spontaneous moments, the, the thing that I love is when, if we're on a moment, and we've been on this progression forever, like when the bass player will call out chords. That's like my favorite thing, to like add new energy. They're picking those progressions? Yeah, they're picking progressions on the fly. So, and it takes a lot of trust, and not everyone can do it. That's something you have to kind of build with history. Um, but chord progressions, I usually tell them never talk dynamics, because dynamics is something that's like a little sticky if you're like, okay, build it here, no, come out, you know, like, I'm not super into that, because it's, you're taking away that person's, like, initiative and their feel, and you're kind of squashing it and making it reliable on only, like, Bob over here, who's, who knows, you know, <laughs> maybe he's not hearing the spirit, you know? so I think it's better, and these are good and awesome, and sometimes can be a hindrance. Do um, we have time for one more question? Yeah, one more question. Just as someone who's been through like all of the steps and worship leading and you've come into this like super big role, how do you keep the tension between humility and excellence um, and balance that well? Yeah. Humility and excellence. Um, how do I stay humble in this role? <laughs> I mean, it's... I mean... I don't know, I don't think of it as like, like if I wasn't getting paid to do worship music, I would still do it. Like I, there's something in me that's like burning for this. Like I know there's something on my life in it. And it could look like in a stadium or it could look like in a prayer room full of maybe like 10 people. Um, I think that's always stuck with me and I know that like, that he is worthy and he like this it's not on my power it's not on my like my strength that like any of this happened this is like 
because he needs a willing vessel. And so I'm, I'm saying yes, and um, I mean, there's no reason for me to be like, Mr. Hotshot. I feel like the moment I'm that, the moment is the moment he finds someone else. You know? and so I think that keeps it very humbling and very close to me. And I think, like Pastor Lee said, you know, creativity um, comes from intimacy. And it's so real, like you've... Like, spending that time in the quiet place of the Lord is so vital in all of this. Like, it, it, keeps, it keeps him near, and it keeps, like, things in perspective. And, yeah, I don't know. I don't, there's no room for egos. There's no room for um, Mr. Hotshot guy. You know, I've dealt with a lot of those people, and there's just no room for it. You know, and it's, I'm not into that. I don't know who it is. But, <laughs> anyways, yeah, I, can I pray real quick? Yeah. You guys, thank you guys for coming. Um, yeah, Lord, we just thank you for your kindness and your goodness, and we thank you for your nearness. We just ask that um, you would give us divine ideas, new strategies, new techniques. We ask that you would anoint our hands to whatever we touch it would be amazing. And we ask that you would visit us in, in the night, in dreams. We ask that you would give us even visions during sessions, God. You would give us ideas that would just come in a moment. We thank you for your goodness and how good you are to us. We love you very much. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you guys so much.